Okay, so without further ado, we've got Michael Blumenstein talking about AI and data ethics. Let's not believe the hype. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Simon. Thank you all for being here. I won't go through any introductions. Uh, I'll just go straight into it. I've only got 12 minutes. So I just wanted to talk to you about artificial intelligence. And I, so I know we're, we're talking about data, and we'll get to that in a bit. But artificial intelligence is where I'd like to start, particularly around this huge rise of AI popularity, and to the point where people are getting so freaked out that AI is going to you know, come back Terminator style and do something bad to us. So I, I'm here to say that it's, it's not exactly where it is at, OK? That, that, is, that is not exactly the full story. So you know, we, we, we think of artificial intelligence in terms of 2001 A Space Odyssey, the bad computer takes over the spaceship, tries to kill the astronauts. That's terrible. Well, 2001 has been and gone, and guess what? That's never happened. And the reality is that um, you know, we're, we're not even close to that happening. You know, but there are people out there, the Elon Musks, the Stephen Hawkings, just yesterday, apparently, spoke out again that you know, AI is going to kill us in 40 years. So my view is that we've got to be a little bit more realistic. One of the major tests for whether um, something is really going to be a computer that can fool humans was this concept of the Turing test. Uh, and the ability of actually trying to communicate with the computer to see whether you could tell whether the computer was actually a computer and not a human. Now, no one has managed to create something that has passed that Turing test yet, not properly. So the question is, are we there yet? Well, we're not. So, you know, artificial intelligence broadly speaking these days, sits in two communities. One is the concept of what we call computational intelligence. That includes things like neural networks, which are algorithms that mimic the simplest activity of the human brain. Okay? Or another way to put it is connectionism, or connection, you know, connection science. But then you've got the old school artificial intelligence, which looks at symbolic techniques, logic, theorem proving, and things like that. Believe it or not, at the moment, the hype is in this spot here, the hype about you know, these things called neural networks and now deep neural networks that are actually producing amazing results and are scaring people because some people think they're black boxes and you can't actually understand what they're doing. So this area has been left behind a little bit, unfortunately, and has actually come out of the spotlight. But you, there are your hardcore AI fans of the classical approach that are still there, and that's fine. But this is where all the interest is and where all the money is at the moment. So deep learning, this has come about as a big buzzword. Who's heard of deep learning before? Right, fantastic. Well, I won't go into too much detail about it then, but I will just say one thing, is that it's the revival of the old school neural networks. Neural networks have been around, or well, the concept of a neuron in an artificial sense has been around since 1943. So this is not new. AI is not new, and this is not a new you know, transformation of the landscape. It's been around all the time. We've just had some changes that have allowed it to flourish. So ANNs are, large, are loosely inspired by the brain's you know, uh, most simplest uh, interconnected neuron behavior. But the reality is that the thing about deep learning when it came along in, in around between 2012 and 2014 allowed us to manipulate large amounts of data. The algorithms were improved, and the ability to store the data and actually manipulate it was largely improved. So the applications of deep learning are huge. There's so much around. Everything from you know, using uh, the capabilities inside drones, human-computer interaction, of course, uh, autonomous vehicles, which Stephen Hawking, again, is complaining about, saying that you know, it's going to be devastating for the human race. Don't entirely agree with him on that one. So the reality is the 80s actually was, was one of the times where there was a huge revival like we're experiencing now. In 86, the backpropagation neural network transformed everything. Every paper on every artificial neural network conference was in that space. But it sort of slightly nearly died down at around the 2000s. Everyone got bored and said, What's gonna, what are we going to do there? But all of a sudden, faster computers, graphical processing units, GPUs that were used for speeding up games on people's computers and laptops could now be used for training algorithms and technology that could never be done before because there was not the computing grunt power to do it. And of course, big data. So 2012 with AlexNet and around that time was, a, was around the start of when things really went, uh, took off for the deep learning craze. So what happens in a, in a deep neural network? 
very quickly. You design an architecture in, the, in, in a software or a package. You train it with lots and lots of data. And then you can end up with some you know, uh, recognition, say, of a face or an object or something like that. That's the standard application. That's where it started, image recognition, things like that. So these days, you can get some code. Seven lines of code can, can allow you to implement uh, a deep neural network, basically. That's it. So very simple. You can, almost anyone can do it, pretty much. So many frameworks available, CAFE, TensorFlow. You've got a lot of ways, commercial products, existing, even non-commercial um, products and off-the-shelf software that you can do it. So I wanted to show you one example of where there may be ethical considerations, but where there's a really great application of this deep neural network technology. So one of the projects that I'm involved in, thankfully, um, that I've been fortunate enough to be asked to, to work with, um, is in the area of um, using drones and analyzing video from the drones to detect sharks. So of course, sharks are, are a, a really big problem, a real world problem, particularly in Australia, where we can see the statistics for 2017. It actually improved in 2017, but actually, if you look at it, um, the, the number of fatalities the year before was more, and so was in 2015. But basically, it's a big emotional and political issue. It's something huge for our population, and as a country that enjoys the beach, it's something important for us. So the question was, can we use UAVs or drones to provide real-time monitoring of beaches using um, some sort of software and, um, and artificial intelligence? So in order for us to get this project to work, we had to collect a lot of data. At the moment, we've collected about 10,000 video frames, which have been annotated. And so there's understanding of, of what we're looking at. So in other words, is this a shark? Is this a fish? Is this uh, a dolphin? Is this a whale? Um, we've got a number of labels, so our, our technology can now distinguish between every type of, well, main, you know, m marine animal group, but also other things, humans, cars, everything like that. So we use deep learning based object detection to actually allow us to, to undertake that. So where we are up to now is that we're actually, we haven't just developed the software and it's sitting in a, in a closet in a, some sort of research lab. We're actually deployed this software now. The company we're working with is called Little Ripper, or now transformed to be the Ripper Group. It has now uh, signed an agreement with New South Wales government that we're going to deploy this in 11 beaches in New South Wales. And basically, this is going to allow people, so it's going to be launched on December 15th across those 11 beaches, swimmers and beachgoers are going to probably experience another level of safety, like a non-invasive level of safety that doesn't hurt the sharks, but also doesn't affect them um, with this technology. So we're about to commence an international collaboration where some of my um, team are going to go over to Reunion Island and actually test it internationally and possibly get more contracts internationally. So this is the uh, graphical user interface, this is what it looks like, very simple. Um, you can see that things are being detected in the ocean. The boxes labeled suggest what they are. These are detected in real time. That means that you know, when, the, when the thing's deployed, as soon as it sees it, bang, it's reported back. So at the moment, the drone is able to send SMS text. It's a, it's, it sends alerts. It can be fitted to deploy um, a, a lifeboat, an inflatable boat. It can also use a megaphone to immediately tell the swimmer that there's something in the ocean that's approaching them. So if we go uh, have a look here, here's some sample results. This is some, a large number of sharks detected. As you can see, there are a couple of unknowns there. That just suggests that the system thinks there's a shark there, but it's either too blurry or too difficult to tell. Dolphins, plenty. You can, it, it detects that. It detects boats. It detects kayaks. It also can detect sharks in really difficult conditions, particularly around things like you know, where there's blur, lots of glare, and, and even when the, the water is murky. So we're very pleased. So I forgot to mention the accuracy is around over 90% um, in, in Australian oceans to be able to detect sharks. It can look at eagle rays, drones, people, everything else as well. So um, here's, uh, you've got first audience in the history of UTS to see this. These are the first snapshots of uh, detecting whales and sharks at Reunion Island. So as you can see, the water is quite different off Reunion Island, and also it's actually a totally different condition. So of course, as with any other imperfect AI, you've got to retrain it, and you've got to provide it 
with different data to be able to work under different conditions. So that's some challenges we're experiencing, particularly in murky water, brown looking water. Um, it's actually quite a bit of a challenge. So I'd like to finish off with this video and I'm just gonna show you some, some real time shark detection in action. And as you can see, there are some pretty chunky, difficult conditions. So it lost it there and then it gets it back. But it tracks it so it understands that if it's lost it, it, it knows where to find it again. It can look at, it can detect people on the beaches, it can detect vehicles. Um, it, you know, it's labeled those as surfers, but you know, basically humans. Eagle rays. Um, now these are obviously, some of these are quite shots that are taken from different distances. Obviously when, when it's not, when it's very close, obviously you get a better resolution, you get better imagery, but when it's far away, and particularly when there's waves crashing and other things, really challenging um, type of uh, environment to actually take. So paddle boats and so forth. So the, we're, we're very proud of where that's got to. Um, at the moment, the, the people that are testing it on our beaches are actually surf lifesavers. They're com commandeering the actual drone, the drone technology. So it's actually in the hands of the people that save lives. And, and basically they're the ones, not you know, the technologists that make the decisions on where to go next. So I will finish off very quickly um, with just my perspective on the future of AI. And basically the, the reality is that all, everything I've showed you works great. You know, here's a real life example of something that's being deployed commercially and for the benefit of the public good. But you know, that is, we, are, we are a blip in one spot of the AI spectrum. The reality is there's more to come. So yes, it, it, there's gonna be some controversial stuff down the track, but we're a bit further from that than, than we might think. So for example, one of the inventors of the backpropagation neural network, who probably is one of the biggest you know, characters at the moment, he's now been employed by Google. Um, you know, now th this, this guy's come up with a new concept of capsule networks. Capsule networks are just better neural networks, but guess what, they were on the drawing board since the 70s. Couldn't get them to work, but they were just sitting there in a theoretical sort of you know, situation where you couldn't actually get them to be implemented in real time. Now that's, that's now working to the point where it's better and actually is mimicking closer to the human brain's function. The, last, the second one here is neuromorphic AI. So the real, in my opinion, the real spot where we need to go to get, to get AI that we should be really scared of, because we can't be right now, because I don't think we're even in that realm, is AI that really replicates brain-like function and actually understands what the brain is doing and transfers that into some sort of brain-like chip. And neuromorphic AI is moving in that direction. The reality is that neurobiologists will tell you that we don't understand, we only understand 10% of the human brain as it is now. So it's very difficult if you don't understand the human brain to actually replicate it. So we're pretty far there. The last one, of course, in the Faculty of Engineering and IT, we have the Center for Quantum Software. They're, they've just released two months ago a new quantum programming environment. You can actually download it here. This is one of the future directions for AI, using quantum computers be, to be used in artificial intelligence. So we've actually got a really bright future from the technology side, and I would argue we have a very bright future from the point of view of human safety. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Time for just uh, one question right now. If anyone has one. Have I scared everyone? <laughs> Correct. My argument is that I would find that to actually unpack the evil in us, you'd have to understand it. And so my, my view is that you know you're not you're not gonna be I don't believe there is there is sufficient technology out there to be able to do that. So um, if you're suggesting that maybe there'll be, you know, a, a computer or technology that can actually, you know, come about by not understanding our brain as the basis, um, I, I'm actually very, very sceptical of that. I'm not saying it can't happen, because then I couldn't be a scientist, but I, I would say that it, the probability of that happening is low. I mean, to be realistic, to be, under, to be able to understand how we can... Uh, you know, really get something that will be close to what people are being really scared of at the moment, we really have to understand our own biological function better. Because at the moment, deep learning and all the hype is on the basis of 
of a very poor replica. And just like backpropagation in 1986 went down the tubes and no one even looked at it since 2000, this, is, this new generation is going to go, is, the expectations of what, what they think are gonna, we're going to be able to get out of this, is, they're going to be disappointed. So there'll be a next big thing, sure. When will that happen? 20 years, 40 years, not sure. Um, but but it, 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 I think it, it's firmly based on, on our understanding of the most complex thing in, in the universe, which is our brain. Thank you again, Michael. Thank you. Um, next up, we've got uh, Patrick Lee. Uh, you've already seen her in action. She could have said all of our speakers read more about them if they want to delve into this program. Patrick is uh, doing the MBSI, finishing it, as well as working for the new software. Thanks, Simon. Hi, I'm Pash. Yes, I've spent um, most of the past two years working at the New South Wales Data Analytics Centre, which is the New South Wales government's data science hub. Um, and the opportunity to be there arose thanks to um, the MDSI course director, Teresa Anderson's um, really deep ties um, with industry, and the degree has completely changed my life. Um, but during this time at the Data Analytics Centre, I worked on proof of concept uh, projects to uh, try and apply machine learning um, to extremely sensitive domains, including uh, child protection, and in particular in contexts where machines are replacing human decision making. Um, so today I'm not at liberty to go into uh, specific details, but Simon Buckingham Shum um, was keen for me to share some key uh, learnings from the activities. So they are presented with sufficient abstraction uh, to honour my contract of employment, uh, but with enough insight to benefit the interest that is palpable in this room today. Um, so what do we got? Today we're looking at the ethics of the machine, or why your machine learning algorithm is a sociopathic psychopath and what you can do about it. Um, now, uh, we're going to have to deal with some not so simple questions to get there. So firstly, what is ethics? Can machines learn ethics? And to get to that, we're going to have to cover how machines learn. So what is ethics? Um, ethics is a philosophical discourse on um, what is right, what one ought to do. And unlike other philosophical conversations about what is beauty, what is logic, what is knowledge, um, the difference with ethics is that it compels action. You can't very well have a conversation about what the right thing to do is without then going out and doing it. So. Um, can we teach machines ethics? Well, firstly, how do they learn? Um, teaching a machine is much like teaching a child. So you show them uh, a picture of cat or cats with the label cat um, and repeat it enough times until they're able to see a cat without the label cat, uh, for example, out in the street, and the child says, cat, that's a cat. Um, so in supervised machine learning, the pictures of the cats with the word cat next to them are the training set and the picture of the cat without the label is the test set. So um, what's different? One thing that's going on here is outside of that, there's no context. And a spectacular example of what that means is um, seven, just a few weeks ago, 7,700 paint colors were fed into a neural net. And these are the, some, the ones that it created, some of the good ones. So like ghastly pink and navel tan. Um, and birth pink, but these are some of the ones that got wrong. So uh, it mistook uh, blue for gray and um, green for brown. So what it was missing is um, it didn't have any external truths about the sky is blue, the grass is green, or a rose is red and also white and yellow and pink. Um, another type of uh, machine learning is unsupervised learning. And one of the advantage, and in this process, we're not giving the machine any labels. We're letting it discover uh, patterns for itself. And one of the advantages of that is that it's open to new things or new signals coming along. Um, but one of the disadvantages is that um, because there's an element of dimensionality reduction, what it finds may not be interpretable or um, it may not be actionable. Um, so an example is I put um, YouTube usage data into a clustering algorithm. It to find new segments. Um, it finds a segment of six and 60-year-olds that behave in exactly the same way, but that's no good to me if I can't market to them uh, in the same way. So um, now we know how they learn. Can we teach? Well, what's going on with both of those methods is 
that essentially there's um, algebraic operations happening within a representation space. Or in other words, concepts are represented mathematically and their accuracy is, is tested with statistical methods. So in this context, can we teach machines ethics? Well, unless we're able to reduce um, ethics, or in this case, um, fairness to um, a mathematical definition or equation that works in every context for every subgroup, then at this stage, I'm going to go with what our first speaker was saying, which is no, we can't teach machines ethics, which basically means we're dealing with a bunch of sociopathic psychopaths. <laughs> so still don't believe me, let's look at some of the common traits of um, these people. So one is that they are socially awkward. Boom. <laughs> machines, totally socially awkward as well. Another thing is, is that they don't show remorse. Look at that, ice cold. Uh, another one is um, they have no self-control. And we, we also heard earlier today how when robo-traders wipe out $100 billion in market cap in a few minutes, they clearly have no self-control. And don't believe me, this guy also seems to think that his computer is a psychopath. So if that's how they operate, then what can we do about it? Um, you may have heard of the interesting case of James Fallon, who was a neuroscientist who inadvertently discovered, that's another story, that he had the gene for full-blown psychopathy, or for being a psychopath. And yet he was a successful university professor and a happy family man. So what he worked out was the difference between that gene being activated or not was he had an extremely happy childhood. So what do we need to do? We need to give our machines an extremely good childhood. And what does that mean? Well, this has also been a theme that we've had here today, that we need to be picky about the data that we give our machines to learn from. So in my domain, um, we should show them only what we want them to learn. In my domain, we have these huge longitudinal data sets of uh, decisions that have been made in the administration of government services. Um, and there's an equally huge temptation to pass those into a machine. But first of all, we have to stand back and say, um, you know, were there some people that were poorly trained? So we've got some poor decisions in that set. Or worse, were there, was there occasional bias or prejudice being exercised in those decisions? And the important thing there is that a machine learning algorithm will pick up occasional bias and apply it systematically. And what the visiting chair of data mining from Eindhoven University pointed out to us is that it actually increases, the rate of bias decision making increases when it's fed to a machine. And then finally, what about less than optimal decisions? So the example there is I may have a client, I have the ideal service that I want to give that to that client, but it's either fully booked or it's not available in the area. So at the time, all you have a record of is me giving them not the ideal service. So do we want our machines to learn that? So really, there is this curation that needs to go on, um, bearing in mind what these machines are capable of. The other thing we need to do is socialize them fully. So that means um, what I'm talking about there is we need to give them all the data they need to learn from. And are, um, the test there is, are all the factors that are available for a human to consider when making the decision, are they also available in data form for the machine to replace them in making that decision? And around the same time that we were discovering that we possibly had a potentially fatal flaw in the design of one of our projects, um, this paper came out from the National Bureau of Economics Research in the US and they, uh, in January this year, and they basically had um, an incredibly similar but better articulation of the problem, which is uh, they wanted to apply, again, machine learning to replace human decisions. They had a choice between um, judges deciding to grant bail or judges deciding to um, deciding sentences. And they chose to train the machine on bail decisions because everything the judge takes into account in granting bail, so whether the perpetrator has ever missed a court appearance before, whether the perpetrator has ever skipped bail before, whether the, sorry, the severity of the offense, it all exists in the data. In contrast with sentencing, other things are taken into account. For example, the remorse of the perpetrator. And often that is something that the judge reads through um, body language. Um, and other non-data elements. So there are two things we can do in that childhood, so in that learning um, training phase. 
Now, what do we do when these psychopaths grow up? So when they're out in the wild, don't tell them where you live. Um, and what I mean by that is um, wherever possible, we should be withholding discriminating characteristics. And what I mean by that is like personal information, which we otherwise shouldn't discriminate on. Um, we shouldn't be giving them to the machines. And then we also need to test, because we may say we've done that, I don't have gender in there, I don't have age in there, I don't have ethnicity, but it could be that there's still proxies for that, in that data. And um, these academics from across five universities in the USA came up with a test, a machine learning algorithm test, <laughs> where if they can predict based on your data set, which you think is clean of these personal characteristics, if they can then predict gender or predict um, your race, then um, it's failing the test. Okay. And then the second thing is don't let them prey on the weak. And what I mean by that is um, you need to test your model accuracies on different kinds of people. So because um, algorithm accuracy is, um, only cares about the size of its mistakes averaged over all of the training data, um, it may have very different accuracies on different groups. And it, that's actually amplified on minorities because there are fewer of them within the, the data set. And so it doesn't care as much if it's getting them wrong. So the example there is I may have 90% accuracy on men, but only 50% accuracy on women. And with these two methods that I've just described, there's a slight logistical challenge, which is on the one hand, we want to put our hands on our hearts and say we haven't used personal information uh, in the running of these algorithms. But at the same time, we also need to retain that personal information to keep testing and making sure that they aren't um, exhibiting discrimination and bias. And we can do that. And the separation in principle that has been developed in health research um, can allow us to do that. So in conclusion, we need to be careful about how we are raising and training these algorithms. We need to keep on testing their inputs and outputs. And I think an ultimate test of the ethics of the machine might be to say, you know, would you trust your children with the machine? But moreover, now that you can see that the structures of ethics come from what people put in place around the machine, the question should, in, should instead be, do you trust your children with the makers of the algorithm? Thank you. Um, yeah, so to repeat the question, um, the question is how, how can you be sure that you remove factors that exhibit bias? And in particular, for example, in the legal examples I gave, that remorse and interpretation of remorse may contain bias or even some of the factors that you took into account um, in granting bail, so previous offences may contain bias. I think um, the methodology, there's two separate things going on. So first of all, really, um, you have I'm going to put my legal hat on because I'm a solicitor and say that it's about removing um, the elements that we know by law you can't discriminate on, as well as what else I said, which you said earlier today, which is you then test for those to see if there's any proxies in your data set. But insofar as what the judge was taking into account, what the judge was taking into account in either sentencing or bail, I mean, that's the legal system. So that's not, um, you know, we're data scientists, we can't solve everything. Um, and so in my example there, I wasn't talking about um, one set of factors for each of those use cases being biased or not. It was just about the scenario that was best suited for training a machine learning algorithm was one where all the factors that are used are actually in the data. But yeah, beyond what's legally compliant, and as that academic pointed out, like what is the definition of fairness? How, we, how can we teach machines to be fair if we can't even decide on the decision of fairness? Like, those are big questions, and we should keep asking them.
Okay, next up we have Rebecca Cunningham from the Institute for Sustainable Futures. And Rebecca's going to do something slightly different in her slot. Uh, we're actually going to re watch a recording of something she's prepared while she wanders around the auditorium doing something mysterious. My name is Rebecca Cunningham. I'm a social scientist working in the Institute for Sustainable Futures. For the last four years, I've been working in climate change. It's been wonderful, terrifying, amazing, overwhelming, and we're being rewarding despite the existential crises. Yes, plural. So this presentation is exploring humans, climate change data, and ethics. Climate change information is all around us, some explicit, some tacit. This symbiotic and fragile relationship we have with this planet is transferred through the air we breathe, the water we drink, the buildings we live in, and places we go to play. However, for the majority of the time, this information is conveyed to the many in dense and abstract forms, and there are often a lot of graphs. We've got global emissions from fossil fuels and cement, or G20 countries' annual CO2 emissions per capita over time. The impact of CO2 actually has been keenly examined as we know in the Arctic region, its temperatures having been measured for decades are increasing at an alarming rate. We know that this warming in the Arctic region means melting tundra, which equates to sea level rise. What this might mean for countries most exposed from sea level rise is indeed devastating, putting millions of people at risk. And this is within the two degrees of warming that was agreed upon in Paris in 2015. There are numerous efforts looking at carbon budgets, the most famous, of course, coming from the IPCC. However, all of this data, all this information, is what we have known for a quarter of a century. This data is often paired with familiar images, often painting a bleak picture for the future of our planet. However, I'm often left wondering, where are the humans? As a social scientist in 2014, I was working in India, performing a social network analysis to understand best non-dissemination channels for a new seasonal climate forecast. This was aimed at the agricultural industry, as rainfall patterns are changing and crops are often failing. I sat with a group of farmers and they told me they can't plant paddy, rice anymore. At least, not the way they used to. They used to song, handed down from generation to generation, to follow the seasons for planting and harvesting. These songs don't work anymore. What almost broke my heart was that one farmer, a leader of their community, spoke about the cultural significance of rice. They need paddy for community events, births, deaths, marriages. His mother had recently died, and the crop had failed, and he had no paddy, no rice to take to the funeral. His pain was felt by everyone in that room. Climate change isn't something that happens to other people in other places. It is happening to us here and now. More recently, earlier this year, I had the privilege to travel to Kiribati, a remote series of coral atolls in the Pacific. Along with another researcher from the Institute for Sustainable Futures, we were mapping the knowledge networks around water salinity and use. Kiribati has one of the highest rates of childhood morbidity due to poor drinking water. In Kiribati, the land is too salty to grow food, the fish stocks are declining. And on the outer islands, people are more likely to find out the water was bad once they were already sick. Although the project was successful, more needs to be done. Not in 30 years or by 2100, but now. People are dying. Sea level rise is an everyday reality. And every morning, we had our coffee gazing out on the sea that was literally at our doorstep. It was a constant reminder of that urgency. For these people, climate change is very, very real. The children that I saw playing by the beachside near the Marinembe, the Gary House, they are paying such a high price for our lack of action. And how is that ethical? Kevin Anderson, who was in Kyoto in the 90s, um, provided this quote from a meeting of the Institute of the International and European Affairs. We knew everything we needed to know about climate change in regards to mitigation in 1990. 25 years quarter of a century of complete and utter failure to address climate change, and I think we need to remind ourselves how abject that failure we have presided over has actually been. 
mitigation hasn't and isn't happening fast enough. The two degree COP target still exists and countries have agreed to attempt to meet this target. However, our emissions continue to increase and the models for future climate change indicate four degrees of temperature rise is now likely. And the impacts of which are just beyond devastating. So what can we do alongside mitigation? Adaptation, making changes to the way we live, which allow us to survive until society learns to effectively reduce carbon emissions. And it is local, contextual, and happening. We can make changes now, both in the country and in the city. And we've seen it for years. Um, adaptation at a local scale, for example, solar panel. It is an adaptation, but with a mitigating effect. Here in Australia and New South Wales, we are very conscious of heat. This is a surface temperature map of Leichhardt on a hot summer day. The areas that are purple, deep purple, are urban heat islands. Some of the cooler yellow shaded areas on the edges are coastal, but not all of them. You can see cooler areas even within the built environment. In particular, the bottom right hand corner of the image is the cooler suburb in this local government authority. Why? Because it has retained substantial levels of tree canopy cover. It sounds simple, but why aren't we doing it everywhere? Heat has an impact on human health and well-being, but also on infrastructure and energy systems, as we need to use energy to cool our environment. As a society, we have the ability to design for anticipated change. This is an example of a change model developed for energy systems here in Sydney. An attempt to move away from business as usual by following a series of transition pathways to a designed and desirable future. This is actually part of a broad scale strategic planning exercise in collaboration with ISF, UTS, and the New South Wales State Government, during which the researchers have spoken to over 1,500 government decision makers covering over 91% of the state's local government areas. It's about making change local, contextual, and achievable that can contribute to mitigation, but also improves health, well-being, and survival of local communities. Understanding the lived experience of people allows us to design pathway to a transformed future. Mm -hmm. The traditional scientific chasms and silos of knowledge don't engage public at scale. We as a society, and as a scientific society, need to engage in conversation. Now more than ever, we've got the tools to engage industries and civil society in transitioning to adapt to climate change. Companies such as the Cross Dependency Initiative, or XCI Sydney, launched only last week here at UTS in the data arena, and they're working with state and local governments, research organisations like us at ISEF, and industry to collaboratively adapt our essential infrastructure to climate change, bringing together large-scale large scale data, approaching like a petabyte of locally scaled climate change data, using immersive technologies to understand risks. Back in 2016, I worked with the University of uh, Manchester and the Manchester Museum to collaborate with the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change scientists on an exhibition called Climate Control. It was open to all ages and the exhibit encouraged thousands to read their thoughts. We presented climate data in artistic forms such as performances and films working in particular with uh, artist Rachel Parry from Nottingham and Biff from Australia. We even did cooking shows looking at food of the future. We also worked with the Manchester City Council and the Climate Change Agency in order to engage civil society in amassing a city through play, Lego. And each of these buildings were annotated and offered to the City Council to inform their planning to reduce their emissions to net zero by 2030-2050. They created green buildings, transformed education, energy, transport systems, and the, even the working environment. At UTS, here at the Institute for Sustainable Futures, we're working with creative studios such as the Blue Trot, based in LA, exploring virtual realities, allowing people to experience environments like coral reefs adapting in Belize, allowing people to interact with the science that is informing this transformation in an immersive environment like never before. You may have been wondering this whole time, well, this is a TEDx talk, so where's the speaker? Well, like billions around the planet, without actions on climate change, our will no longer exist. We have the tools, it is up to us to Hopefully by now, you'll have in your hand a small pebble. And I'll leave you with this quote. 
I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. And I ask you, take this small pebble and create ripples that will create a better world. Where's Rebecca? Hi. Rebecca, thank you very much. That was fab. Um, so my concern, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I just wanted to put it out there, is I think the problem for all of us with climate change is there's a bunch of people who aren't doing their job. That's my expression of the problem. I do what I have to do. I get paid. I pay my taxes. I vote. I vote for people I think should be doing things to fix this, and they're not doing their job. Um, welcome comments from you and anyone else. So are you, uh, this is in regards to the policy change. This is in regards to everything that needs to be done on the planet yeah. and should have started back in 1990 when we knew what we know now to fix this and no one's doing their job. Mm. Uh, it's hard. Uh, the good news is things are happening now just not at the rate that they should have or could have or sh yeah, should have. The political will hasn't been there because people were making money and the system that we live in always prioritised money over people. And I think now that we're getting to the point where in the West we are experiencing the very harsh edge of climate change and it is now affecting our economic systems because of people rocking up to AGMs at banks and at insurance places. Um, we're working with insurers and the finance sector uh, because these types of extreme climate events cost their money. And so they're worried about that now. And they're rolling out, the XDI project is also because there's a, they have to put climate change in their business plan now. I think these are some levers that will finally force businesses to act. But because there was no political incentive or, or stick, uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been enough, but in the next few years, there will simply have to be uh, because the, eco the economic system won't survive. I guess, I guess what we all need to do then is say to, things, say to our banks things mm. like, I'm not banking with you if you don't have sustainable yeah. practices. Mm. Put, the, put our money where our mouth is. And, and I have spoken to people from a bank and an insurance company that said it is because activists rock up to our AGMs and say, why are you paying your executives this? What are you doing about climate change? What are you doing about this? What are you doing about climate change? And asking that question every single time. And finally, finally, there is, there's some forward motion. You're doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Next up, Peter Frey, sharing a perspective from the, uh, the Centre for New Media Studies. Have I got that right? No, not no, quite. Media, media transition. Tr media transition. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks, Simon, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, um, for the next few minutes, I want you to trust me because I'm a journalist. <laughs> so uh, the power of journalism rests in the, uh, in the gotcha moment. The gotcha moment. The gotcha moment when the, a person is laid bare, an institution is laid bare. Here's a few recent examples of gotcha moments. There's the dual citizenship <laughs> fiasco. There's the outing of sexual harassers, and there's even the tax affairs of the Queen and Bono. Who would have thought it, eh? Anyway, so uh, my first gotcha moment uh, came when I was very young. Uh, and it was the first time I understood the power of journalism. Uh, it happened when I was a primary school student, and a kid came up to me in the schoolroom and said, your mother is a thief. And before I could uh, sort of offer a boyish expletive, he said, she, yes, she is, and he brandished a copy of the local newspaper, and there indeed was a story about my mother who had stolen a can of baked beans. It's a sad story, but I, I'm not telling this story to uh, say, isn't it amazing that a son of a thief could rise to the professorial ranks at UTS? I'm really talking about it as, I'm actually talking about it why I think journalism works. Journalism works best when it works on an emotional level when it provo provokes an emotional experience. 
And in most cases, unless it involves your mother and cans of baked beans, it works because it takes you outside of your own experience. It takes you to a place where you probably haven't been, to an understanding of an event or a personal experience. And in fact, journalism works when it makes you feel. And I apologize for those terrible edits, but you get the drift. Now, in journalism, we uh, eschew sometimes this kind of gotcha moment, the emotional. Uh, in the academy and the industry, uh, we are probably more likely to wish to talk about uh, you know, cultural issues or, if you like, more intellectual issues or even craft issues before we talk about the power of emotion. And there is also an, a, a tendency to see gotcha journalism as a rather crass and unthinking uh, part, a purview of the tabloids. And of course, you know, despite the huge amount of thinking that it would have gone into that uh, particular headline about the sinking of the Belgrano during the Falklands War, uh, it works because it is unthinking, because it works because it makes you feel. And it is the power of emotion and the potential of deep learning technologies to facilitate and enable human emotional response is what I want to talk about briefly today and how those responses could actually really be about the future of journalism and how that re future requires us to consider how the same machines can be utilized to enhance trust in journalism and at the same time that requires us to increase our efforts to develop new and transparent frameworks for that trust to be distributed. We live in a very emotional times, right? We feel faster than we think. We are receiving news and information faster than we think. And we are sharing that news and information often just as fast, often without reading. In a way, as I've just explained, I hope that you know, news has always been emotional, but now it is enriched by technology. It's all a bit scary, and, but there's nothing to run from as if we had the opportunity to run from it. I think it's a great opportunity. Because the unprecedented dis uh, di upside of digital disruption is that it has gifted us the capacity to connect and engage with people and to understand what they want and who they are. This is what Facebook knows about me. It's a, it's a smidgen of what Facebook knows about me. Uh, and it's essentially what Facebook uses in, in its knowledge about me to sell to advertisers so advertisers can advertise to me. And if you want to get your own version of that, uh, do a quick search on Pro, Publica, and Black Box, and you can download a Chrome extension. I think the news media, both legacy and emerging, can do other and better things. As the scholars Mark Deutzer and Charlie Beckett have suggested, a journalism that links news to emotion and that connects to people and that deploys positive psychology to the sharing instincts of audiences could actually have the makings of a sustainable model. And to this, I would very much add the dynamic that comes with using deep learning. So these, I just want to talk briefly about a couple of projects that the Center for Media Transition is involved with, with um, other members of FAS, uh, uh, sorry, other members of FAS, other members at UTS, and, uh, and industry, and other external parties. Uh, first off, I'd like to go to this guy. Right, now he's exhibit A in how certain people in invoke an emotional response which is, of course, his power, and let's hope will also be his downfall. <laughs> you simply can't be ambivalent about this man. And, of course, as you know, uh, Trump delivered an initial uh, upswing in the circulations of quality news media in the United States, and that's because they have uh, deeply engaged audiences and they're able to engage more people who cared about the, what was going to happen under Donald Trump. But what I'd like to see is how we can harness the emotional power of Trump to assist people less engaged in the news to become even more so, to become more so. So I conceived of the Trumpometer, and I've enlisted uh, a, PhD student, a PhD student in, in fate, uh, whose name is Wenming Huang, and the artist and cartoonist and my dear friend Rocco Fazari. And this is what we've done up to now. Rocco has drawn a series of generic faces. This, this is just a couple of them but emotional, uh, uh, that each have a different emotion. And we've thrown that into an AI. And then Rocco, uh, then Hamming threw it into an AI. Then Rocco created a series of Trumps, and he threw those into an AI. 
And then, uh, he, then, we, uh, then uh, Han Ming asked him to create some more uh, generic faces, so chuck them into the AI. And then Han Ming asked the AI to produce its own Trump, and this is what the AI produced. <laughs> now, well, this is all great fun, so why on earth are we doing this? Right, so, so this is my initial idea. Can we make it easy for journalists to generate Trump heads by simply speaking at the machine? And can, each, uh, can you use these Trump heads as a way of engaging uh, people who are not necessarily engaged with the news with the news of the day? So ideally, uh, a journalist would go, um, three happy Trumps, and that would be the day, for instance, that, you could, uh, that Trump's tax bill passed Congress. And then you could say, four angry Trumps, which would be the day that Jared Kushner is indicted for coll collusion with the Russians. Now, so this is simply a way that this could be shared uh, uh, out on social or shared on individual stories to try and engage people who are not necessarily engaged with the news with the politics of the United States. And I must confess, we did first think about creating the Mallow Meter, but then Rocco suggested that we might run out of time. <laughs> and it might not be. So, but I really want you to think of a way of, this is a way of engaging the emotions of readers. And perhaps what a news organization should say about the trump meter to its readers in terms of trust and transparency. So I suggest the media company needs to be upfront about two things, two key words. One is intention, why are they making it? And the other is accountability, who is responsible for it? Just leave those two thoughts with you. The next project. Um, one of the kind of holy grails of machine learning is the idea of automated fact-checking. And I've had a very little bit to do with this. And up on screen is a thing called Claim Buster. Again, you can download that. And the, uh, the idea uh, of that is that um, we can use natural language processing to find out that the machine can tell us essentially when a politician is lying. Now, there's a lot of problems with that because, as we'd probably all immediately guess, that politicians... Uh, that machines don't really do very well with satire or nuance and such like. But it'd be an amazing thing if you could just have automated fact checking. Um, but actually, that's not this talk. But if you, um, if you would like to look up Claim Buster, <coughs> you will notice that I managed to persuade Claim Buster to um, put in Hansard. From, so this is a, a project based in the University of Texas. And what uh, Claim Buster puts out every day through this uh, NLP, it recognizes uh, in different shades of blue the likelihood of a politician making a factual statement. As I say, this is not automated fact-checking. But what if, along the way, we could harness similar technologies, similar deep learning things, to the cause of recognizing and exposing commonly deployed fallacies? So the types of fallacies that find their ways into your news feed and, and are common in news media, and which, which are really the building blocks of fake news. And then what if we could use that information to create a, a tool that would enable early high school students, say, to develop better critical thinking skills so that they could identify and avoid unsound or un erroneous re reasoning. And that's the goal of the Straw Man Project. And I should very much like to pause at this point and recognize that the straw man is primarily the work of uh, Gabriel Jacob, who is an honor student in FAS, and also the one or two of the wonderful people who are sitting in this room, Simon Knight and the wonderful speaker next to come, Chris Akita. So these fine people are hunting down the fallacies and will drive the creation and testing of a fallacy-busting machine. And as I say, my overarching goal is to get the fallacy uh, into the, uh, New South Wales schools and the New South Wales Board of Studies is already interested. But to do that, I think, again, we must play with the emotions of people. And I want to create, I think we might need to gamify this idea. We might need to create an avatar to enable high school students to interact with it. So I think the straw man, the he of the straw man should become a she. And we've all heard of Khaleesi, the mother of dragons. Well, I'm keen to think about Felici, the slayer of fall fallacies. Anyway. So can we create a hero's journey towards truth using deep learning? I think we can. There is much more to be done on both projects. 
but it really gives us a chance to think about trust and transparency. As you probably know, trust in journalism as a, is at a record low uh, in this country and many others. And if getting it back is going to be a, a very hard job. Uh, because especially among young people, they can't recall the time when you uh, simply trusted something because it was the brand that you saw every morning on your coffee table or whatever. Um, but I do think it's interesting that uh, there was a survey out last week that showed that people are more likely to trust what they see than what they read. So I think there's a capacity to use deep learning again to produce video and other forms of visuals that may enhance trust, especially among young people. Um, about five or six years ago, I brought the fact-checking service PolitiFact to Australia, and I still think, and the idea was that could fact-checking be used to restore the truth-telling aspect of journalism? And I still think that fact-checking has a role to play. But I think the real problem with fact-checking is that it didn't actually answer this emotional quotient. And I think this was a missed opportunity. Because even though we showed the workings behind our fact checks and we cited lots of references, we needed to be even more transparent about what we were doing and why we were doing it. We needed to be more responsive to our readers' needs and so we could talk really about our intention and our accountability. And there's plenty more things to say about this whole thing. But I think in the age of AI, that it's quite possible that we can, when we build trust and we talk about responsibility, we really need to talk about the role of the machine and the role of the human. And we should need to be talking about the, the who, who does what, when and why, and who takes the rap for when things go wrong. Thanks for listening. Please do that. Uh, thank you, Peter, though. And, of course, the point is that you can now grab these people and uh, pin them to the floor over coffee in the break that's coming up very shortly. But Kirsty Keto, next up. Um, Kirsty is one of my colleagues in the Connected Intelligence Center. Who gets education data? Kirsty. Um, so what I want to talk about today um, is access to data and who understands data. And I'm going to do this in the educational context because, well, actually universities, they collect a lot of data. Um, so we've been collecting data for, for years. We've been collecting data for <laughs> decades, really. Um, we've been collecting data, well, all universities collect data about student satisfaction. We collect data about grades. We collect data about how students traverse campus locations. Um, we collect data about staff what staff are doing on campus, lots and lots of data. But we've always had very isolated, siloed data. So we've only really started as universities joining up our data in really quite recent history. And what universities have started doing is they've started realising that actually data is really powerful. We can do a lot with data. So we can start helping students to optimise their learning. So we work a lot in the field of learning analytics at KIC. And really what we're doing with learning analytics is we're trying to use data to try and help students to learn more effectively or to help staff design more cohesive learning experiences and to actually um, develop better teaching environments. So we can use data to really like, change the educational landscape, buy better technology, work out if the technology actually helps us at all. Um, so we're really starting to use data much more effectively at universities than we ever used to. And there's new data standards emerging and new opportunities to use data in education. So um, just in the last three or four years, we've actually seen two new data standards emerge out of education technology, um, XAPI or Experience API and um, IMS Caliper. And these are both new data standards that essentially let us collect data from ubiquitous mobile environments. So a lot of the educational data that we've used to collect in the university system has been very um, it's, it's been very isolated and difficult to join up um, and very restricted to, for example, environments which are very managed. So, for example, data that's collected from a learning management system and can't be maybe using, well, <laughs> data that's coming from a learning management system, but we know that most of our students are all over the place. They're using their mobile phones, they're using uh, home computers, they're using a whole heap of quite wild environments. So we've got new opportunities emerging. But at the same time, 
there's challenges coming as well. So right at the time where universities are working out that data is actually a really valuable resource, we can do a lot with data, we're moving to cloud systems. And sometimes we're losing the chance to actually control the data and to extract the data that we're finding so useful. So we're making decisions in multiple parts of the university that are potentially going to work against each other. And we need to start getting very strategic about how we use data in the educational system. And all companies are facing these challenges. It's not just universities. So what I want to do today is think a little bit about the questions we're asking in the university context. Because there's a lot of talk about privacy. Um, and privacy is important. Privacy is very important when it comes to educational data. And we do need to be very careful with data. Um, and we need to be very careful that the right people have the data and that the data is not misused or abused or the wrong people don't get their hands on that data. But there's other things we have to worry about as well. And I get worried sometimes that we're not actually asking the right questions because actually what we tend to worry about is privacy and we forget about things like access and ownership of data. So, who gets access to educational data? If they do get access to it, do they get it? <laughs> do they even understand it? And who owns that data? Where does it sit and who's responsible for it? And I'd like to see us starting to shift our conversation along a little bit more into some of these more nuanced questions that we could be asking ourselves. Um, so, one thing I'd like to point out here is this is actually a, um, a drawing from a talk given by um, Audrey Waters, who's a big um, talker in educational technology. She was asking questions about who owns educational data at least five years ago, according to this picture that I've got here. Um, and yet the concept of data ownership in the university system has not really um, managed to transmit into a full-blown conversation. So, question one. Who creates educational data? Um, and where are they creating it? Students create educational data. Staff members create educational data. Um, where are they creating it? They're not often creating it in our nicely controlled systems. So I've had to change my picture because I've moved to UTS. But when I started doing this research, I was at QUT and we had a beautiful new learning environment, very similar to the UTS, beautiful new learning environments. Our e-learning services had turned on all of the technology for a new STAR course we were running. And my students, after I'd gotten them all into groups at the end of the first day of class, um, signed over their Facebook accounts to each other. And they weren't using the learning management system at all. Um, so if you were predicting maybe student success, or trying to develop ideas and models of what students were doing in your system and you were just using the learning management system data, then you had very bad data. And yet we had an entire organisational unit that was trying to predict student success off of the back of student behaviour in the learning management system. So who creates the data and where do they create it? Something that we need to be very aware of when we're thinking about learning and how we can actually optimise learning or do it better. But who gets access to that educational data is a question we don't often ask. So is it the strategic intelligence unit at the organisation? Are lecturers getting access to the data? Are students getting access to the data that they themselves generated? And this is an important question to be asking because quite often what we find is the people who can most understand that data are the people who generated that trace. They understand what they were doing when that trace was created. But they can potentially have a hard time to understand the traces unless we treat them well and do a good job trying to work out what, in fact, is going on there. So, if I, as a lecturer, look at this digital trace, what do you think I can learn from that? So the person who was teaching the course could tell me a very good story about what was going on in that digital trace. She was using blogging as the mechanism for the students to communicate with each other. When do you think she had the deadlines for the blog posts? <laughs> you can see it very clearly once you know what's going on. Until you know what the pedagogy is behind that data trace, it's quite hard to interpret. Um, but the students and the lecturer could understand that trace very easily. Now this is a very easy digital trace to start interpreting. 
but sometimes they can get much more complex. If you get into things like topic analysis, then quite often the experts or the people who generated the data can understand those topics much more completely than um, just a straight computer scientist who's maybe running the models. So the interpretation of these digital traces is generally much easier to do when you're at the level of the person or the people who are most closely associated with creating these digital traces. But the thing is they can only do this when they have some training. It takes a lot to teach students and staff how to understand data. It's a new way of thinking generally. Um, and you can get yourself into a whole heap of trouble if you just give students access to data and expect them to understand what it's saying about themselves. And in fact, they can misinterpret it quite profoundly. Um, so you could end up, for example, if you have a student who's from a low socioeconomic status, sort of first in family situation, coming to university and feeling like they don't belong, deciding that yes, in fact, they don't belong if you tell them that they're at risk of failing because they haven't been showing up to their classes. So with your analytics and with your data, you can generate a reality which you're actually trying very, very hard to avoid if you're not careful about what you do with your data. But I would like to argue that we actually have a duty of care as educators to do this. So just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. And the reason we need to be worrying about this is because everyone is starting to perform this kind of analytics on your data. So there's a battle, essentially, for control of data that's emerging. And if we send our students out into the world without teaching them about, about algorithms and clustering and how different things are going to be used to analyse their digital traces, we're leaving them grossly underprepared for interacting well in that world. And we need to be very careful that we actually do provide them with the training they need. So here's a couple of projects that um, we've been working on at KIC um, and a few different other places over the years. So one way in which we try to generate an understanding in our students about the data traces that they leave will be around how can I actually get data from all those ubiquitous environments where students learn? How can I pull it together? How can I do some analytics on it and then give it back to those students in ways that make sense? So this is a project that was funded by the Office of Learning Teaching. Um, and essentially what we do is we interface with social media APIs, we store the data in a standard format, we do some analytics and then we give people back contextualised data, contextualised analytics that helps them to understand what they're doing. But there's a problem with that. Um, if you just go, hey, I've got a nice dashboard, go and have a look at it, things tend to go a little bit wrong. Um, and what you find is students don't tend to apply that knowledge back to themselves. They don't reflect on what it says about themselves and they don't change their behaviour patterns as a result. And it can be really hard to use. So you need to be very careful about the learning design and the scaffolding, how you link those, like, those reports and the analytics to the things you're trying to get students to do. And that's where analytics really meets learning design and assessment and the field has only really started to acknowledge that really well and it's becoming quite a theme in the field. Um, here's another thing that I'm thinking about lately which is sort of a scaling up of this first project I was talking about. So personal data, educational data is something that students will increasingly find invaluable when they're trying to do things like claiming competency, returning to university when entire fields of employment dry up. Um, universities always have an already have an enormous problem with recognition of prior learning and we're going to have a tsunami of people coming back to us who don't want to sit through an entire degree again. They want to claim just the extra bit of learning they need to go back out into the world again. We need to enable them to actually show that they've got um, competency and credit already, that they've gained in many different places. So we're starting to think about, well, how could we develop architectures that enable students to aggregate data from multiple places, make sense of it, and then use it to claim recognition and competency. And that's another project we're working on at the moment. So final proper vacations, because Simon's about to hustle me off the stage. <laughs> um, can we create a data ecosystem? If we're going to be ethical at UTS about how we treat data, we need to be thinking about how we treat student data. How can we create like a data ecosystem that enables students to have control and access and potentially even ownership of their educational data? I think that's something we should be trying to do. And how can we 
convince employers that that's actually something very useful and that that data store that students are harvesting and collecting about their own competencies and achievements can actually then be used to claim that yes, actually I'm expert in this thing and this is why you should be giving me a job when they go out into the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Because we're running a little over time, we're just going to move straight to our last presentation. Last but by no means least, we've got Joe Trevaglier from the health faculty here. And um, here we go. This one? Yes. There we go. And Joe is going to give her a glimpse, give us a glimpse into her world around health data. Yes and no. <laughs> Yes and no, not so much about health data. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is a project that uh, Dr. Hamish Robertson and I have been working on for a while. And it's less about health data per se and more about the sociology of knowledge. And in particular, sort of taking the Foucauldian perspective of knowledge is something that is for cutting. Um, and we're looking at big data from that perspective as applied to vulnerable groups and vulnerabilities in general. So, our starting point is actually completely stolen from philosophy, even though we're not philosophers, but it really is a question of how problems are identified and dissected, how concepts are included and excluded when circumscribing problems, and how we uncover and rediscover forgotten problems and solutions. A few weeks ago, I heard on the radio that Robbie the Robot, Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet has just been sold. And of course, I'm a good academic, so I went to look for research purposes only how much he sold for. And as I was looking at images of Robbie, who is the quintessential robot, I came across this image. Whoops, which has disappeared. How weird. That's not going to work really well. <laughs> That's very odd. I'm just going to have a look because the image is important. I don't know why it was... Um... <coughs> I don't know why it was hidden. Maybe someone thought I didn't have copyright. I do have copyright. Well, at least I have copyright to show it to you. It's an image by Mark Bryan, who's an American uh, artist. And as I was looking at this image, it struck me as one of the best metaphors and re visual representations of the things that we're looking at in terms of big data. You can see both utopia and dystopia in this image. But you can also see one of the things that Hamish and I have been thinking about for a long time, which is at the core of big data, which is seen to be located in a futuristic environment, are actually images and concepts that go back for centuries. A lot of those concepts inform how we understand big data, how we construct big data, how we utilise big data. The danger of big data is often that we look to the future and we look at what might happen without looking to the past and how we got here. Big data is not just the amplification of small data, but it can be the amplification of the risks of small data. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, briefly. So human beings are informational and sense-making creatures. When I studied anthropology 30-odd years ago, we used to be tool-making creatures, but we've since discovered that both otters and monkeys do that too. Um, but we are definitely informational and sense-making creatures. We try and make sense of the world around us. We try and cre create metaphors, visual abstractions of what's occurring. And we jump from one form of information gathering, data gathering, and knowledge making, which is data in a context that can be utilized as we go along. So small data has a problematic social history, which most of us know in academia and most of us know in industry. The categorization and quantification of the social domain um, gained momentum in the 18th century. And it wasn't just accidentally that it gained momentum in the 18th century. And the fact that it gained momentum at a, po at a point where we became Victorian, at least in the English-speaking world, has significant implications. Because at that point, we were not just looking at trying to find what was normal, but we were normalising what human behaviour was about. So small data and large data is used for cutting. So those sort of issues continue to date. The social sciences are implicated in the consequences of data use and misuse. And one of the things that struck me as um, Michael was talking before is we may be many decades away from creating a thing of evil, but we're centuries into using evil things. 
and data is one of those things that can be used in an evil way. We need to be concerned with the statistical and the mathematical rules to bolster the science of small data and its application in science. One of the glamours of big data is it's got to be better, right? It's bigger, larger, stronger, there's more of it. We're searching stuff that we could never search before. We're pulling together things that can't be, have never been pulled before, together before. And that glamour can lead us down ways that say we replicate some of the errors that we've done in small data in a large data context. So, for example, one of, the, one of the things that everybody talks about is the implications of data in terms of information about people. One of the things that we don't often talk about is who's left out of that data collection process and one of the implications of being excluded. It's not necessary that everybody is included. For example, not everybody in Australia has a Medicare card. If you were looking at the application of big data in terms of health and looking at service delivery planning and location of healthcare services, you don't have an accurate picture. It's tempting to believe that, but it's not true. A lot of Indigenous people don't have Medicare cards. They're not on the system. They don't want to be. The more you know about them, often a greater the, risk, the greater the risk that they're at. So you can see the tensions between big data and small data and inclusion and exclusion. And some of those things are some of the things that we're trying to expose and understand about. Um, data analysis often disconnects from social outcomes. Again, one of the dangers of thinking about big data as objective as opposed to the subjective nature of some small data. But one of the risks of the parabolic rise of algorithms used in the as a mechanism of social control is in areas like predictive policing. And there was a big debate that's come out recently in terms of the police at Redfern, where they looked at predictive policing and surprise, surprise, the people that are most likely to predict to uh, to uh, cause crimes would be Indigenous people. We know what the social determinants of crime are. We know what people's experiences, their social constructs, they can, they, the fact that the police are more likely to pick you up if you're a non-white person, and all of that goes into the algorithms, and the algorithms become self-fulfilling prophecies. Many of these issues can become magnified in what is a big data paradigm. So big data is emergent, it's digital, it's hyped, it's positive, totalising, transactional, and it is unfinished. As large as it is and as powerful as it is, it is still unfinished because it is still a human endeavour and it will always be unfinished. Some social categories are being used as before, but there are new analytical forms and implications, old ideas and new and more powerful technologies and claims to legitimacy. And the ethics come into those claims. Who's claiming what for whom? Who is included? Who is excluded? And what are the implications of those processes? Technologies have and are invested with social influence, authority, and power. And just like the Mona Lisa in that futuristic context, those social influences and authorities and power are strong and residual and, rel and lie in the hands of people who have been powerful for many centuries and many decades. So the technology might be different, but the worldview is not. Hardware and software are not passive entities. They influence knowledge production, understanding and positions, and they have direct ontological influences in people's lives. So what do we need to problematise in terms of big data? Not just the Vs, the volume, uh, the velocity of data, although obviously these matters. Um, the quantitative qualitative divide is increasingly redundant as qualitative experiences can be digitalised. But what does this mean about their appropri appropriation and legitimisation? When we draw on the lived experiences of individuals, how are they represented? How do we understand them? The quantities and variety of data are beyond previous experiences, but the social implications are both the same, use, misuse and abuse, and different with new risks and possibilities. There's a generational change in the methods and the concepts and approaches we, do, we use to create, analyse and utilise data. And so we're in a, in a time of epistemic transition, which is why we need an ethics of big data for our time. We need to see big data and its attendant technologies in historical context beyond the utopian and dystopian cycle. 
We need a critical position on the social applications of big data in every domain. We need an overt, informed, ethical position on big data tools, their designs and their consequences. A lot of discussions about this were held this morning, so I won't go into more of that, particularly at this point. But it's one of the questions that needs to reverberate throughout the process as that process takes place and not afterwards, which is the standard discussion in small data. The classic is, we'll deal with this first, we'll build it, and then we'll think about what's going to happen. This is an opportunity at a time of epistemic leap to think about it at the very beginning. We need a social science perspective, and I'm not just saying that as a social scientist, but we do need a social science perspective to inquire on the social implications of big data in the fields as it develops. And we need to understand the methods that influence our understanding of data. Technology is never neutral. Bell's preemptive question is, what is the worldview that is contained in the technology? And we kind of flagged some of that throughout the day when people were talking about race. The persistence of race as an ontological concept when it is a social construct is something that influences many algorithms. And yet people are still using 18th and 19th centuries understanding of what the concept of race is to help determine factors like predictive policing. So the question, yes, is about the mechanism and the technologies, but more profoundly it's about our worldview and our misuse of social sciences. Isaac Asimov, to just close off, said one of my favourite quotes, the saddest aspect of life now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Thank you. That's a brief version. <laughs> <laughs>